And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. God is good. And all the time, Permit me to say, Sabato and Jema Watuwema. You did not understand? Well, let me tell you in English. Happy Sabbath, good people, children of God. How are you? You are well? God protected us during the night, and we thank Him for that. I very often say that every night all over the world, people go to sleep expecting to wake up in the morning, and they never do. Every morning in hospitals, nursing homes, on Skid Row, in private homes, every morning someone is found lifeless. God woke us up. Somebody say amen. And he does not give us another day of life in order to sin. He gives us another day of life in order to do what is right in his sight. And so we thank God for his mercy. I welcome you to the house of God. We're living in strange times. Everyone wearing a mask, following medical recommendations, and that is fine. But we live in strange times, and they will get stranger. We ought to get closer to God. Our priority, particularly in these last days, in any age really, but particularly in these troubling last days, our priority ought to be get close to God. Because the Bible says there's coming a time of trouble such as never was since there has been a nation. Thank you for coming to listen to the Word of God. I welcome those of you connecting via Facebook and YouTube or any other electronic means of worshiping with us wherever you are. Thank you very much and may the Lord bless you and reach your heart through this message. Is there anyone in this building with us? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. May I see your hand? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. Ah, would you kindly tell us your name? Stand. Did I see a hand over there? No, I did. Oh, okay. Would you? Oh, we have a microphone coming to you. So the whole world can know who you are. Good morning. How are you? Is that Mike alive or dead? Yeah. 
All right, there's no life in the mic. Well, just tell us your name. We'll try to hear you. It's coming. Not yet. All right, tell us your name. What's your name? Tell it. What did she say? Catherine is a good name. Catherine, where are you from? You're from what part of Kenya? I've been to Nairobi many times. I've forgotten how many times. Welcome, my dear sister. Thanks for joining us. And Mungu Akubariki Sana, na familia yako. Anybody else? You're not a you're you're guest among us. Where? Anybody? Where? Oh, hi. How are you? Uh, a microphone is coming to you. Hopefully, this time it works. Ah, there we are. Good morning. Good morning. How do you do? I'm good. It's nice to see you. What's your name? My name is Andrew. Who? Andrew. 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 Yeah. Oh, Andrew. That's Simon Peter's younger brother. Andrew, where are you from? Kenya. Oh, Kenya. 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 Where in Kenya? Uh, Nakuru. Nairobi, the place of cold water. It's nice to see you, Andrew. Pleasure. And may the Lord bless your life. I really mean that. Thank you very much for coming. Say amen for Andrew. All right. Say amen for Catherine. Andrew, who invited you? Elder Charles Mokaya. Who? Elder Charles Mokaya. Elder Charles, oh yes, that's my brother. All right. Elder Mokaya, thank you for working hard. Andrew, thank you very much. Catherine, who invited you? My cousin, Lena. Your who? Cousin. Your cousin, Nina. Nina, you're a nice person. Thank you for bringing Catherine. Say Amen. Is there anyone else who is visiting with us? A visitor, a guest? Just raise your hand. We must recognize you. Is that a hand that's raised over here? Oh, would you stand? Good morning. How are you? A microphone is coming to you. You may drop the mic the mask slightly. What's your name? Um, I'm Jeremiah. Jeremiah. Good Bible name. Jeremiah, where are you from? I'm from TME. From where? T M E, the mountain of experience, S D A. T and B. But where are you from originally? I'm a Kenyan. Oh, is there anyone here not from Kenya? <laughs> or okay, all right. Okay. We have two, three. Jeremiah, who invited you? I was invited by my brother Kefa. Kefa? Yeah. Where is he? Ah, in the balcony. Well, Jeremiah, thank you for coming. God bless you. God bless you and keep you. Mungu akubariki na mungu akulinde. All right. Anybody else? Your guest. There's no one else? Have we exhausted all our distinguished guests? Okay. For those of you who are not Seventh-day Adventists, you're watching via Facebook or uh, YouTube, thank you very much. We as a Seventh-day Adventist church are always delighted and honored to have guests among us because you could have chosen to spend your time another way and another place. You chose to be with us and we're delighted and I truly mean it when I say God bless you. Our subject for today, triple trouble. What did I say? Triple trouble. As always, I ask you to do some favors for me. Favor number one, while I'm speaking, I want you to pray for me and say, Lord, Put your words in that man's mouth. That request is based on a Bible verse, Jeremiah 1 verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And heaven and earth are my witnesses this morning, that with all my heart I want God to put his words in my mouth, because my words cannot save you. My opinions have no saving value whatsoever. The words of God, according to Jesus, they are spirit and they are life. So ask God from time to time, put your words in that man's mouth. One wrong word can turn a person off in a service. One right word spoken at the wrong time can turn someone off. So I'm depending on God. Favor number two. If you have one of these as a Bible, make sure it does not ring. That's my only requirement because we must show God extreme reverence. It would not ring in a courtroom. Don't let it ring in the house of God. While I'm saying that, let me make sure that mine is dead. All right. Yes, it is. Okay. Favor number three, think as you listen. Think. Isaiah 1.18, come now. 
Let us reason together, saith the Lord. A Christian is someone who reasons. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 5, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, how then canst thou contend with the horses? Now this is God calling upon us to reason, and God is saying, if you cannot keep up with a man, how do you plan to keep up with a horse? We serve a God who reasons. He is a reasonable God. And so I ask you today in the name of this Jesus, reason and think as you listen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I am weak. I am flesh. I am dirt. But upon me, you have placed the burden of doing a spiritual work. Father, I need your help. First, forgive me if I've offended you. Remove the offense, dear God. Remove the sin and grant to me the righteousness of your Son. Grant to me a double portion of your Spirit, not for my sake, dear Father, but that the Spirit may speak through me and that the words I utter may be your words. Bless those who've come to listen to your words, dear Father. Bless those listening via YouTube and Facebook and any other means of connection. Let the truth triumph in their hearts today. Send angels that excel in strength to protect us as we listen to the saving word. Bless every country represented by those listening, Father, but particularly bless the host country and this host church. Bless the leaders of those countries. Let them make decisions that are not only right, but righteous. Father, at the end of this message, let your name be glorified, Father, and your people blessed. Thank you for the honor of speaking for you. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name, let God's people say, Amen and Amen. Our subject, Triple Trouble. Let us go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis 3. And we'll read from verse 1. And I read from the King James Version of the Bible. Genesis 3, reading from verse 1. The Bible says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, He shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, He shall not eat of it, neither shall he touch it, lest he die. And the serpent said unto the woman, verse 4, He shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Adam and Eve sinned. To understand this more clearly, let us go to chapter 2 and read verses 16 and 17. Our subject, triple trouble. What was our subject last night? Misfits and mismatches. Yes, very good. Genesis 2, 16, 17. The Bible says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That's what God said. In chapter 3, verse 4, the devil speaking through the serpent said, Ye shall not surely die. And so we have God saying one thing, the devil saying something else. And from then until now, we have the same dilemma. Shall I listen to God or shall I listen to someone else? And the choices are two, the word of God or the word of the devil. 
The word of God comes through instruments. The word of the devil comes through instruments. But there are only two voices. The voice of God, that's truth. The voice of the enemy, and that is error. God said, if you eat of the tree of which I have forbidden you, you will die. The devil said, if you eat, you will live. God said, if you sin by disobeying, you will die. The devil said, if you sin by, or by eating the tree or disobeying, you will live. Triple trouble, why did I say that? Now that Adam and Eve have sinned, God comes down to talk to them. Verse 9 of Genesis 3. And I'll pray again. Father, I need help constantly. Give it to me now, I pray, please. In Jesus' name, amen. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, verse 9 of Genesis 3, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldst not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Now listen to what God says to the serpent. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. If you look at verse 14, God said, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. We are introduced to the concept of a curse. By the way, God blesses or God curses. It was never ever God's desire to ever utter a curse. But because of sin, God uttered curses. Satan lied. He lied to Adam and Eve or to Eve. And based on that lie, which is the foundation of deception, she did what God said not to do. He lied. The Bible says, thou shalt not bear false witness. The devil lied. In other words, Satan sinned against God. He sinned against uh, the first woman ever created. And God said, because you have done this, you are cursed. First mention of the word curse. It was pronounced on the serpent, which was an agent of the devil. Let's go now to what God says to Adam. In verse 17, of Genesis 3, our subject, triple trouble. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. Now we have the second instance of a curse pronounced on this earth. The very first instance, it was pronounced on an agent of the devil. By the way, as I say, agent of the devil, let me speak to preachers who deliberately preach error. You are walking on very dangerous ground. The devil, using an agent, spoke error. And the response from God was a curse. The human beings who accepted that error, God's response was a curse. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and the voice of Eve was the voice of the devil. Because in that time that she tempted Adam to sin, she was an agent of the devil. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. First curse on the serpent representing the enemy. Second curse on the earth because of Adam's sin. The whole earth was cursed. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4. In 3, 17, verse 70, chapter 3, we have the first curse on the earth, on the earth itself. In chapter 14, the curse was on the serpent. 
uh, chapter 3, verse 14, the curse was on the serpent. In verse 17, the curse is on the entire earth. Chapter 4, reading from verse 1. I'll pray again. Father, still speak through me, God. Give me no release, no relief from the work of your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Let me go back to verse uh, 5. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Verse 4 says, And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Verse 5 said, The Lord had no respect for Abel, nor for his offering. What you bring, its acceptability is dependent upon the condition of your heart. An evil heart cannot give to God a blessed offering. God rejected Cain and his offering. God accepted Abel and his offering. The Bible is a holy book. The Bible says holy men of God wrote a holy book. And to Cain and his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. And Cain talked with Abel his brother. Verse 8. And it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. First murder. By the way, Cain was also the one who built the first city on earth. The first city was built by the first murderer. I don't know what significance that has, but most murders occur in cities up to today. The first city was built by the first murderer, Cain. That's further down in chapter four, chapter 4 of the book of Genesis. Anyway, Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. And the Lord said unto Cain, verse 9, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. We have a second curse on the earth. God cursed the earth. In the time of Adam, verse 17 of Genesis 3. Now he curses the earth again because of the first murder. When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. So you have curse number one, curse number two on the earth. What's our subject? What's our subject? Triple trouble. Let's go to Genesis 8. Genesis 8, we read from verse 20. Genesis 8, reading from verse 20, this is after Noah and his family have exited the ark. And Noah built an, off an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast and every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled the sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not what? I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. For the imagination of man is evil from his youth. God said, I will not curse the ground this way again, which was, of course, the flood. We have the third curse on the earth. Cursed because of Adam's sin, Genesis 3.17. Cursed because of Cain's murder, Genesis 4, 11, I believe, and 12. Cursed the flood, Genesis 8, 21. The earth was under a triple curse. 
Now go to Genesis 28. Genesis 28. We read verse 12. And you may say, well, this sermon is depressing so far. Well, maybe, but I'm getting to the nice part, so please be patient. What book did I say? What chapter? Let's read from verse 12. Fathers, I'm about to continue in Genesis 28. Speak through me very precisely. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Verse 12, and he dreamed. Jacob deceived Esau and stole the birthright. He worked in a union with his mother. They both deceived Isaac, who was blind, and stole the birthright. Esau found out. He got very angry, and he wanted to kill Jacob. The mother found out, Rebekah, and she warned Jacob, and she told Jacob, run away, go to your relatives in Haran. And so Jacob is traveling towards Haran, miles and miles away. He is tired. One night he lies down on the ground to sleep. That's what's happening. Verse 28, verse 12 verse of chapter 28, and he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. This was a symbol of Jesus Christ. I want you to observe. First, let's establish that it is a symbol of Jesus Christ. Go to John chapter 1. John 1, we read verse 51. The last verse of John chapter 1. Our subject, triple trouble. John 1, verse 51. Jesus saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Christ is quoting Genesis 28 verse 12. In other words, he's identifying himself as the one symbolized and represented by the ladder that touched earth and touched heaven. What I'm bringing to your attention is this ladder that represented Jesus, it not only touches heaven, which represents his divinity, it touched the earth, which represents his humanity. But for us to understand how Lord Jesus came to save us, he touched an earth that was under what? A triple curse. In other words, Jesus took our condition, our weak, fallen condition, in order that he might save us. Who was this Jesus who came to the earth as a man? Let's find out who he was. Let's go to John 14. We're looking at his character. John 14, we read verse 30. These are the words of Jesus Christ himself. John 14, reading verse 30. Jesus said, Hereafter, I will not talk much with you. For the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. Jesus said, my life was so lived that the devil can point to nothing in my life. What he meant was there was no sin in my life. Even though he came and took a triple curse condition. Let's go to John 8. We read from verse 44. Our subject, triple trouble. John 8, reading verse from verse 44. Jesus says, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. That's how Jesus describes the devil. And because I say the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? That's what he's saying in verse 46. Which of you can point to sin in my life? Of course, the answer was none of them. And so John 14 verse 30 tells us Christ was sinless. John 8 verse 46 tells us Christ was sinless. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're looking at this God, this Christ, who touched heaven and touched the earth. 
As surely as he was God, so surely was he man. As surely as he had that flawless divine nature, so surely did he take our weak and fallen nature. As we continue with triple trouble. First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 18. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as with a lamb without spot on without blemish. Jesus Christ was without spot and without blemish. This was the one who came in our condition. If you've not yet been impressed by the fact that Christ came, let's take a closer look of who this Jesus was. Let's go to John chapter 1. We'll read from verse 1. Our subject, triple trouble. John 1, reading from verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The same meaning the word. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. Jesus Christ is clearly identified as the creator. Yes, acting on the will of the father. But Christ is the creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning was the word. You may say, who is the word? Verse 14 tells us, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus Christ the one who said, let there be light. The one who stretched out the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. This mighty God who is bigger than the universe. He came as one of us. This is a sort of teaching and biblical fact that requires days and months and years of reflection. It is a mystery of mysteries. That the God who made heaven and earth is the God who was born in a manger. The God who stretched out the heavens is the God whose hands were nailed to the cross. He did that so that he might deliver those of us who were born into the world triply cursed. Jesus Christ is God. Was God. Is God. And was the one who came to this earth as a man. Understanding what you and I go through. He understands what the murderer goes through. He understands what the thief goes through. He understands what the adulterer goes through. He understands what whatever the bank robber goes through. Because Jesus took the very nature we have. Go to Hebrews 2. Hebrews 2. We read verse 11. And then verse 14 of Hebrews to our subject, triple trouble. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. That's Hebrews 2.11. Look at verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he himself also likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, he took the same flesh. He himself also likewise took part of the same. The mighty God who made heaven and earth is the one who came. As one of us to live as someone in a world under a triple curse which means there is no degree of evil that any one of us can practice from which Jesus Christ cannot deliver us there is no addiction from which Christ cannot deliver you There is no traditional sin from which Christ cannot deliver you. There is no so-called traditional curse from which Jesus Christ cannot deliver you or me. And there is no twist in my character that Jesus Christ cannot straighten. 
As a man, Jesus understands. <laughs> you see, it was Jesus who stood among Sinai and said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. It was Jesus Christ speaking for the Father. Let me say it again. The voice on Sinai was the voice of Jesus Christ before he became a human being. He said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Then he became as a man with weak flesh. He understands the feeling of the adulterer, the fornicator, the whatever. He understands and he not only understands, it is not enough to understand what can you do about it. As a man, Jesus Christ understands your struggle. As a man, as a human being, many of our friends, they understand, but they can do nothing. Jesus understands when you are laughed at in your classroom by your classmates because you're Christian. He was laughed at in his childhood. As God, he can do something about it. As a man, he understands. As a God, he can respond. We live in a world under a triple curse. It cannot get any worse. You see, four is an earthly number. Three is a divine number. And each time the curse was pronounced, it was pronounced by God. The Bible says what God cursed, you cannot uncurse. What he blesses, you can't unbless. A triple curse. Jesus came to deliver us from that curse. But here's what he did. He took on the curse. You didn't hear what I said. It's my fault. Let me try it again. Jesus took the curse, triple, on himself. Go to Galatians 3. Galatians 3. We read from verse 10. Galatians 3, reading from verse 10. And I hope someone has said, Lord, Put your words in that man's mouth because I need that help very critically. If you found Galatians 3.10, say amen. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, curse is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. What the verse is saying is, a curse is pronounced on anyone who does not obey God perfectly. That's all. Now, look at verse 13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Now, we met the very first curse in Genesis 3.14. Question for you. You can speak through your masks. Who pronounced that curse? God. We met the second curse in Genesis 3.17. Who pronounced that curse? God. We met the third curse in Genesis 4, 11 and 12. Who pronounced that curse? God. Now, take a deep breath before you answer this. Who pronounced the curse on Christ? God. You know why? Christ took all our sins on him. Go to Isaiah 53. Triple trouble. And I'm coming close to the end of the message. Triple trouble. It's 5 to 12. Do you have Isaiah 53? At your leisure and your pleasure, read that entire chapter. It is entirely about Jesus. All 12 verses talk about Jesus. Verse 4, Isaiah 53. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The verse ends. And the Lord has laid upon him. Finish the verse. The iniquity, come on, of us all. All sins. The Lord has laid upon him. The iniquity of us all. In John 1, 29, when John the Baptist saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, 
which taketh away. The word for take away is to carry, to bear. You know, it's very popular to see people with backpacks. Christ takes the backpack of sin and he does not take it off until the redemption is all over. The Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Now, what does this mean? I was preaching somewhere, and after the service, a man came to me. He said, I need to talk to you. I said, certainly. He said, I killed a man about 25 years ago. It was self-defense. Okay? Can the Lord forgive me? What's the answer? Yes. But in order to forgive him, the charge of murder has to be removed from that man. Who can finish my words? The charge of murder has to be removed from that man and placed on Jesus. Let me say differently. When I come to Christ, or you come, guilty of sin, and we say, forgive me, dear God, for robbing that bank. God removes that sin from you or me and puts it on Christ. And we walk away innocent in the eyes of God. Now, the police will still come get you. But it's not the police who decide if you go to heaven or hell. Are you with me? We're talking about God. In the eyes of God, you rise from your knees innocent of that charge. You didn't do it. He did it. You're looking at me, but you're not following me. Well, maybe you are, but I don't see it reflected in your masked faces. Listen to me again. When we come to God and confess a sin, that sin is removed from us and placed on Jesus. He now takes the blame and the guilt and you walk away free. That's why he died for us or he died in our place or he took what we deserve. The triple curse that we deserve goes upon Jesus. Mm -hmm. And another night, I will tell you how that can happen and Jesus still remains sinless. Because a, sin, a sinful savior, there's no such thing. I will explain when God leads me how it is that Jesus can take the triple curse of our sins and still remain sinless. The Bible says he takes our sins into himself. 1 Peter 2, 24, who his, own self, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. He took our sins into us. Isaiah says, he was numbered with the transgressors. He died. He received from the Father what sinners deserve. Let me say it again. Christ Receive from the Father on that cross what sinners deserve. Many, many years ago when I was a little boy, I had to get an injection for some reason or other. And I have very small veins, so the nurse couldn't find them. And I was sitting on a, something, and my mother's standing right there. So the nurse sticks the pin, doesn't, the needle into my arm, doesn't find anything. Then she sticks it again. Then she sticks it again. Then my, I looked at my mother, she, tears were in her eyes. Because her son was being stuck. Now, I didn't cry. But she cried. <laughs> because of what was happening to me. Are you following me? When we go to God and we say sorry. Christ takes that. He does the suffering. He does the crying. And we go free. I once said, and I was very serious. Spiritually, there's a way to regain your virginity. That's confession. Because when you confess, the Lord looks at you as if you had never done it. You didn't hear me? Perhaps this mic is not working. Let me say it again. Spiritually, 
you and I can regain our virginity spiritually why because when you confess you stand before God as if you had never done it he did it who's he Jesus Christ why did Jesus die because of sin not sin he committed let me be as clear as a bell not sin he committed but sin he took and because he took the sins he had to be treated like a sinner the only reason people die is because of sin that's why Jesus died because he took our sins he took the triple curse on this earth because his cross also benefited the physical world Jesus took the triple curse on himself in order that you might receive a triple blessing and so we read in 2 Corinthians 5.21. I want you to go there with me. It is one of the most powerful verses in the entire Bible or in any book ever written. 2 Corinthians 5.21. 5 after 12, I'm coming to the end. Our subject, triple trouble. Let me pray one more time. Father, as I look at this very, very powerful verse, give me simple language I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen very, very carefully, microscopically to this verse. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, let's go through it again, and I want you to identify pronouns. For he hath made him to be sin for us. Who is he? God the Father. Hath made him, who is him? Jesus Christ. To be sin for us, who is us? Us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him who is him Jesus Christ listen to what the Bible says for he the father hath made him to be sin for us for our sake who knew no sin that's Jesus that we might be made now follow me closely as though you're preparing for an exam from medical school. The word made appears how many times in that verse? You check and tell me. The word made, M-A-D-E. How many times? Look carefully. If you have the King James Version, how many times does the word made appear? No one else has the King James Version? How many times does it appear? Twice. Blessings of Twice. Listen to the verse. For he hath made him, that's Christ, God made him to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, based on that verse, what is Jesus made? Speak with confidence even if you're wrong. Are you with me? Let's try it again. What was Jesus made? Sin by whom? The Father, yes. What are we made? Righteousness through whom? Jesus. By God. I appreciate that, amen, but let me repeat. God, you know, the gospel is what we'll study for all eternity. Even angels don't fully understand it. God makes his son who is equal with himself to be sin. Remember, he never sinned. God made him to be sin for us. Now, the verse says he did no sin. So he had to be made sin. We have done no righteousness. So we have to be made righteous. <laughs> think, think, think. Jesus never sinned. Someone else had to make him a sinner. We have never done righteousness. Finish my words. Someone else has to make us righteous. Thank you. <laughs> this happens when you come to Christ and you say, Father, forgive me for my sins. I cannot save myself. I accept Jesus as my Savior. Have mercy upon me. Forgive my sins. In that instant, your sin on Jesus, his righteousness on you. That's why there's no such thing as salvation by works. Because the righteousness is the righteousness of God, not yours. 
Are you with me? Is the righteousness of God not yours? Uh, Romans chapter 8 verse 4 that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us whether it's the righteousness of God the righteousness of the law it is not yours or mine let me try it another way <laughs> the very righteousness of Christ is what's given to us when we give ourselves to him there's an exchange. The triple curse of my life is put on Jesus and he takes the blame. So when I say I'm sorry and I mean it and God forgives me, forgiveness is removing of one thing and replacing it with something else. When I say I'm sorry and that sin is removed, I didn't do it. He did. Then his righteousness is given to me. And I didn't do that. <laughs> he did. So as my sin is given to him, his righteousness is given to me. He gives us something that blesses us. We give him something that causes him suffering. My brothers and sisters, it makes no matter to God how evil you think you are. How wicked your wife may say you are, your husband or your children or your boss or whomever. It makes no difference to God. Come to Jesus Christ. He will remove that sin. The Father will remove it. Place it on Jesus. Literally. And you walk away innocent. The triple curse is on Christ. The triple blessing of Father, Son, Holy Ghost is on you. And if you sin, you come back. Sorry. Same transaction. The guilt, which is the problem with sin, guilt is what kills us. Jesus takes that. We walk away in the eyes of God, innocent. That thief on the cross, at one point, he was cursing Christ along with the other thief. Because Matthew 27 verse 44 says, the thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Both thieves at one point were cursing Christ. But in Luke, by that time, the other thief had repented. He had changed. And so he rebuked his fellow criminal and said, don't do that. We deserve this. This man had done nothing amiss. He said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That's confession. That's everything right there. Repentance. Jesus said, verily I say unto thee today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. That man's sins were on Jesus. And the righteousness of Christ was on that man on the cross. He died righteous. He was put on a cross as a sinner. He died righteous. Jesus died as a sinner. That thief died as a righteous man. Let me say it again. Jesus died as a sinner. He never sinned. He died as a sinner. He was treated as a sinner that you and I might be treated as a righteous person. The thief died as a righteous man as verily as Jesus died as a sinner who never actually sinned. Let Jesus lift the triple curse from your life, whatever it may be. He will lift it this morning. All he asks us to do is to believe when he says, I will forgive you. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is as powerful as let there be light and there was light. As surely as light came from the words, let there be light, forgiveness comes from the words, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let Jesus take the triple curse from you. Let him take it on himself. And stand in faith as he places his righteousness on you. Let me repeat. His righteousness on you. As through confession, your sins and mine are placed on him. How many of you will say with me, Father, forgive me for my sins. And Lord, Place my sins on my Savior 
and cover me with his righteousness. Can I see your right hand? Say it from your heart. Stand up with me. Stand up with me. Then I let you go. And for those of you watching via Facebook, uh, YouTube, say the same thing. The Holy Spirit of God is not restricted by geographical differences or distances. He will do the same thing where you are. Say to God, Father, forgive me for my sins, dear God. And with humility, I ask you to place my sins on my Savior and cover me with his righteousness. Put on him what he does not deserve that I may receive what I do not deserve. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We really do. We thank you, dear God, that the triple curse on this earth Christ took, that we might take the triple blessing, which is the approval of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. In his name, dear God, forgive us, Father. With that forgiveness, give us hatred for sin, because the things we hate are the things we avoid. If there's someone under the sound of my voice struggling with a particular weakness, dear God, let that person fall at the foot of the cross and cry out for deliverance. And that deliverance will come. Even as Peter, when he began to drown, he said, Lord, save me. The Bible says immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand. Let that person cry to you now, dear God, and see how immediately you can lift that burden of guilt. As we leave, let us reflect on what we've heard. That Jesus, who was one with the Father and is one with the Father, took the triple curse that we might have the triple blessing of the approval of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Watch over us, Father. Bring us back tonight to hear your word again. We pray in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen.